Everyone loves a good civil war, but you don't really get many of them anymore. Well, in third world countries they happen all the time, but I'd argue that's just the CIA versus whichever third world hellhole they decide to democratize. Real civil wars are kind of a thing of the past. Most nations have already had their fill of brother wars, but animals haven't, and quite regularly you'll see wars between subspecies or races that can last years and span across whole countries. And that is what we'll be talking about today. My definition for an animal civil war includes animals that look very similar and are not natural predators of each other. Okay, intro out of the way, let's talk about the first animal civil war, and that is the Argentine ant versus every other ant species. To start with, I'm going to need to give you a little backstory on ant war and the specific ant, Linepithema humuli, or the Argentine ant. Now in Argentina where they originate, this ant species as well as any other ant species will form nests and go to war with all other nests nearby, regardless of if they are of the same species or not. If an Argentine ant nest crossed a different ant species, they would tear each other to pieces. And if they found another Argentine ant from another colony, they would rub each other with their antennas, realise they're not from the same nest and then also tear each other to pieces. It's all a bit hostile and is basically the equivalent of you getting stopped on the street and getting killed because you threw up the wrong gang sign. Now this obviously wasn't great for the species for two reasons. One, you're killing members of your own species needlessly and two, the Argentine ant when it would fight other ant species would often lose because it's pretty small and weak comparative to many other species. Anyway, this continues until the 1800s when some Argentine ants sneak aboard a ship that sailed for New Orleans and they then start a new colony in North America. This time however, when the ant colony grew and formed new nests, they no longer fought each other but instead welcomed each other and started forming a super colony that spanned many nests. How did they do this? Well, some people speculate it was due to allopatric speciation and the inbreeding that it causes, removing the ability of the ants to differentiate between nests, but I have a separate theory. I believe that amongst the Argentine ants a leader arose, a Lisan ant Raib if you will. This ant united the colonies and began his holy war, in which they collectively outcompeted and forced their will upon every other ant species in the United States. These ants spread throughout all of North America, before eventually spreading to Europe and now El Humili is present in the trillions in every continent, except ironically Antarctica. All this done by an ant which has a Latin name that means humble. I guess this just goes to show the power of in-group preference and how you can use it for world domination. This global hegemony may not last forever though, as recently breakaway colonies have formed. Such as in San Diego where a separate, hostile El Humili colony is formed and both the San Diego and Super Colony regularly have battles that result in about 30 million ant deaths every year, and a war front that extends multiple miles. Even with this recent mutiny, overall I have to say that the winner of this ant civil war will have to be El Humili with a decisive victory. They're actually so potent of a species that they're considered a super invasive species because they thrive in almost every environment and outcompete most of a species due to their sheer numbers. The next animal civil war that we're going to be looking at is the Red Squirrel versus the Grey Squirrel War. To understand this civil war, we have to go back to 1875, one year prior to the first batch of Grey Squirrels being released in the UK. Cyrus vulgaris, or the UK red squirrel, were the dominant squirrel species and were found all across the UK. They have a body length of around 18 to 24 centimeters, weigh around 300 grams, and have a lifespan of around 6 years. Their diet consists mostly of seeds, fruits, and flowers, and they often store their foods in caches so that they have backup food sources if they become scarce. At the time, the red squirrel was the only squirrel species in the UK. And this was the status quo until some idiots decided to bring some grey squirrels from North America over and establish a population on their grounds for ornamental reasons. What they probably didn't foresee was the fact that added squirrel competition would be bad for the native population. Cyrus carolinensis, or the grey squirrel, is much larger than the red squirrel, weighing on average 50% more. They are also around 30% larger size-wise and have lifespans that are generally longer, living for about 9 years. 
In simple terms, the grey squirrel physically mugs the red squirrels. But even though they are much larger, the grey squirrels do not actually physically attack the red squirrels. In fact, the grey squirrels are the much more docile of the two. If you enter a grey squirrel's territory, they're likely to just hide or scamper away. But the red squirrel, on the other hand, is known to be very aggressive and will bite you if they feel like you're encroaching on their territory. So, how did the grey squirrel nearly wipe out the red squirrel then? Well, it's for a number of reasons actually. The grey squirrels have a better digestive system for breaking down high tannin content seeds, allowing them a wider variety of food sources. They also reproduce much more quickly than the red squirrel, having around 10 kits per year to the red squirrel's 6. And finally, the biggest reason why the grey squirrel outcompeted the red squirrel was was because the grey squirrel is a walking bioweapon. The grey squirrel carries a disease called the squirrel pox virus, which the grey squirrel already has built up an immunity for. So a grey squirrel carrying the disease has no effect on the animal. This disease however is fatal to red squirrels and, and red squirrels that become infected with the disease will die a slow death within two weeks. Just imagine being a red squirrel minding your business in your own home and out of nowhere a massive uglier version of yourself enters your home and gives you the equivalent of squirrel aids. With the only difference being that squirrel aids kills you much faster than regular aids. All these factors led to the grey squirrel outnumbering the red squirrel about 15 to 1 with only about 200,000 red squirrels left in the UK, found primarily in the northern parts. I would have ended this section by saying the grey squirrel outcompetes the red squirrel and I would be handing a decisive victory to the grey squirrel. However, with recent conservation efforts, a third party has joined the battle. And that third party is... Us. Yeah, we kind of have a bit of a stake in this war. The red squirrel would have already been wiped out had it not been for human intervention and conservation efforts. But not only that, the red squirrel now has a new ally in the battle for the forests of the UK. The brown-haired pine martin is a natural predator to both squirrels, but because the red squirrels have co-evolved with the pine martins, they're better at evading them, as well as the pine martins preferring to eat the grey squirrels. This new player has drastically shifted the tides of war, and now the red squirrel population is on the rise once again, and is being spotted in areas that they previously didn't inhabit. So, unless the Americans send in military aid to support their invasive grey squirrels, I believe that the red squirrels will eventually reclaim their top spot and, and win the squirrel animal civil war. The final civil war that we'll be looking at is another ant civil war. Yes, yes, I know, another ant war, but can you really blame me? These ants just love war. They even form ranks of soldiers in a face off before they start tearing each other to pieces. It's actually really cinematic. Ant war is actually so common that they even have battle tactics and recruit their soldiers based on the type of threat that they face. This time we'll be talking about slave making ants. No really, that is literally their name. This is basically any ant they can get its hands on. First, let's talk about the slave making ants themselves. There are many types but we'll be looking primarily at Polyergus lucidus. They're about 7mm long and form colonies that mainly consist of worker ants. These worker ants, however, don't actually do any work and cannot care for their young or even forage for food, and this is because their mandibles are a lot longer due to being specifically evolved for raiding other ant nests. I mean, it's a pretty bold excuse for being a deadbeat parent. Imagine if us humans had something similar to this. Yeah, I can't care for my child because my arms are far too muscly. However, I can go out and enslave some plebs to do it for me. Yeah, I don't think that's going to hold up well in divorce court. Anyway, the most common victim of P. lucidus is Formica inserta, which is just one of your bog standard normal ant species. They come in at around 5mm and don't really have any special adaptations, so in a fight between P. lucidus and this ant, the slave maker ant can quickly rip them apart. A typical slave raid will go like this. A scout will find a target nest and head back to the slaver nest to gather a raid party, and then they'll all descend upon the nest. The sight of these raiders will make most of the target nest workers flee, allowing the slaver ants to carry off ant pupae and larvae back to the slaver nest. These larvae will then hatch inside the slave nest and associate the slave nests as their own and begin to work feeding and caring for the slaver ants young. 
and that is how these slave ants grow their nests. Even though the captured slave ants associate the nest pheromones as their own, some still choose to rebel against their captors. In fact, in some slave species, they've even evolved the behaviour to destroy the slave ants' larvae and deposit them outside the nest so as not to arouse suspicion. This sabotage really affects the population of slave ants because if the people you've assigned to take care of your children are secretly killing them, then it can quickly spiral into a huge problem. And this is one of the main problems of being a slave making ant and is why they don't really reach population sizes that are too large. It's not 100% clear why these slave ants do this, although some people speculate that it's because reducing the population size of these slave making ants means a reduction in raid party numbers and a reduction in raids. So in the long run it is very beneficial to the slave ant species. It's hard to say who the winner of the civil war is to be honest because the slave making ants are literally dominating the slave ants and stealing their children, but those children sometimes grow up and get revenge by killing the slave maker ants larva. And the majority of slave ant species grow larger nests than the slave makers because they're actually capable of providing and building for themselves. But if we're talking purely war and the battlefield, then the slave maker ant gets a decisive victory. Anyway, that's all we have for animal civil wars. If you want to learn more about ant wars or would like to join a coalition aiming to sow discord within ant super colonies for our own monetary gain, then consider liking and subscribing. But other than that, thanks for watching. Hope to see you in the next one. Bye.